Greetings, Brother Ravana Noon back once again. This new video is dealing with the African androgynous deities, gods, goddesses, archetypes. One thing that uh, many people are not familiar with here in the West is that in many African tribes, African cultures, they have what is considered uh, the two spirits individuals, also known as gate, G-A-T-E, keepers, or they're considered uh, people that have the androgynous spirit within them, or they can be a male with a female spirit, or a female with a male spirit within. Patrice Malidona Somme speaks about this in his books. Um, Credo Mutua speaks about this within some of his videos and things of that nature. See, we here in the West have been indoctrinated in many levels. We want to consider ourselves African. We want to consider ourselves uh, very connected to our African culture, but we're actually a lot of times very far removed. We've been indoctrinated, brainwashed with European philosophy, European culture, European moralities, European a lot of things. The problem with that is this, that a lot of the homophobia running through the conscious community would not be found in certain African tribes. I didn't say countries, because you have a lot of the leaders of these African countries who were educated in France. Uh, were educated in Germany, were educated in England, and when you become educated in those countries, you start to take on a European mindset, European philosophy, morality, and understanding of things. You have to really pay close attention to some of the presidents, prime ministers, or you know, country, the leaders of these countries in African countries, they don't speak for the majority of the masses of the country. They speak for the educated, wealthier group of individuals, just like you have in any other country. Don't get fooled just because there are people there or they're melanated or they're African. Do not get fooled. Do research and background on a lot of these individuals. You will see that they took on a lot of the European philosophy. The European philosophy, no matter um, what people think, is very anti-everything. They're anti-homosexual, they're anti-lesbian, they're anti-other races, they're anti-nationality, they're anti-everything. Unfortunately, that's not, I'm not speaking to all of them, I'm speaking about a lot of the people um, who are in positions of power, position of finance, things of that nature. They hold on to these old ways and they still project it onto society. We being here, raised in the West, have African bodies, but European minds. A lot of us still suffer from that. It takes years of reprogramming, deconditioning, and deprogramming the crap that's been put in your head. I started this process when I was 18. I'm now 46. And I've done a, a very good job of deprogramming, reprogramming myself, and deconditioning all the crap that's been put there. Would I say I'm 100%? Probably not. Because... That's still an ongoing job that most of us will face until our last breath. But for the most part, I'm in control of my faculties. I'm in control of what comes in here for the most part and what I put out. So when we deal with the concept of androgyny, the concept of the gatekeepers, right away, there's going to be apprehension, there's going to be an attack, there's going to be a lot of anger within the melanated conscious community. Because we want to be so super masculine, so super feminine, 
and grab onto some of these European philosophies as if it's ours. And do not realize to do thorough research that these androgynous deities, these gatekeepers, these twin spirits existed in African culture, Native American culture, and things like that. We become very narrow-minded and become very homophobic within our own melanated communities. That's disgusting, it's stupid, and it has to stop. So, what is androgyny? When we take the time to really study what androgyny is, we start to get a better understanding. And one of the things is you got to use the tools that were given to you and turn it back against an individual. According to their dictionaries, androgynous is partly male, partly female in appearance, or is of an indeterminate sex. The original people of this planet, and you can do the research, there's more science coming out today to prove that the original people of this planet were androgynous. Not male exclusively, and not like this new phenomenon, female only, no. They were androgynous, containing both sexes or genders within them. Go do the research, people, you will see. The more you dig up, the further you dig, you will see that there's a lot of truth to what I'm sharing with you today. So, these beings were here first, and through them, graftation occurred where the female was grafted first because she was necessary to incubate the seminal fluid with the sperm inside of it to raise a child. That does not mean she's first on the planet. That means she was first to be able to give birth within their body. Prior to that, a lot of androgynous beings were asexual. Or some were uh, able to give birth outside of their body through eggs. It may seem strange, but keep digging, folks. Now... This is important to understand because when you are dealing with spirits, you will run into spirits of different appearances, and you will run into spirits of all kinds. And when you are in the astral plane, you will see it all. If you're so lucky and work hard enough to get there, you will see it all. You will see that a lot of the spirits are not just human in appearance. And then some are human appearance, but they seem to be androgynous, homorphodite, hemorphodite, whatever. And you'll start to get a, a greater understanding. And we really don't know shit about ourselves as human beings and about spirits and about people and about this planet. And you start to see things. You start to say, whoa, that's our mouse. Now, for these conscious idiots. Okay, so you can't prove spirits are real or anything else. Well, then you just took a thousand years of what you want to grab out to African culture and tradition and completely dismissed it because why? Hmm. See, that's the problem. You can't just dismiss something because you may not have the gift or ability to see or communicate with spirits. It doesn't mean it's not real. If you work hard enough, you yourself will make contact. Then you would baffle yourself and say, oh, crap, this stuff is real. Yes, it's real. For a lot of you conscious idiots who claim to be so African, I guarantee you've never been mounted or rid ridden by a spirit. I guarantee you. I guarantee you've never been to a goon ceremony. E-G-G-U-N, not O-Goon, E-Goon, ancestral ceremony. Sometimes Santeria, they call it a Misa. And you've never seen a spirit mount a person. Or you've never seen or been ridden or mounted yourself. When that happens, you'll understand. Spirits are real. 
Now, as I've said in many of my videos, gods, goddesses, are just simply archetypes, which are characteristics, personalities, powers, and abilities that we humans all can reach and develop. And these archetypes, or what became known as God or Goddesses, were created by our collective unconscious of uh, a supreme form of a level human beings could reach to. So, no, they're not real in any sense. But the archetype the symbolism can be utilized because the symbolism works with your subconscious mind and activates those latent qualities, correct characteristics, potentials, and powers that resonate with that symbol of the archetype and can activate it within you. So let's get this clear. We have to really start digging deep within our own African heritage, our tribes, our cultural ways, things of that nature, to really start to understand this paradigm that we're living in. Now, you may ask, well, Ravana Noon, who are these androgynous Archetypes, African archetypes. Good question. Let me share it with you. And make a list of these, please, and go research and check things out for yourself. I'm sharing this because some of you all may want to work with some of these archetypes to answer questions that you may have had for a long time. You may want to uh work on certain aspects and some of these archetypes are perfect for this let's begin with the first african deity awo or awo is a moon deity of ghana which is androgynous Archetype. Second, Amen. From Ghana as well, which is a bisexual deity of the planet Saturn. Baroon or Baoon Lundi and Baoon Limba are sometimes considered uh, androgynous, sometimes considered transsexual, and sometimes considered homosexual lovers. Quiet as kept. They don't really speak about that a lot, but you investigate it, you'll see that to be true. Da, or De, from Dahomey, which is now known as Benin, is an androgynous rainbow serpent. Dan, or Dan, from Dahomey, is a bisexual rainbow serpent deity. Inlay, or Yinlay, for the Yoruba happens to sometimes be a patron of gay individuals. There are certain aspects of Erezuli that are either transgender or has Amazonian traits. She as well sometimes tends to be a patron to gay men and lesbians. Grand Salibo Osilibo Gueto in Vudan is one of the ancient androgynous founders of the race.
there's more. Getty Masaka. There's an androgynous assistant of Gede Nebo. Gede Nebo is an intersex deity of the dead. Happy or Happy of Kemet is an androgynous deity. Aset or Aset or Ast is served by gay and transgender priests and priestesses. Enle Ayaya or Ayaye and Yamaya Mayowelo are sometimes the Orisha Enle emerges with Yamaya to become androgynous. They are the patron of lesbians, gay men, and gender variant individuals. Jok is a Ugandan Jayandras deity. Lisa Maron. African from different parts of Africa, a figure which incorporates both men and women. Lugonde, wait, Lugonede is an androgynous Orisha that spends half of each year as a male hunter and the other half as a beautiful nymph. Mawari from Zimbabwe. Is an androgynous creator deity. From Benin, we have Nana Baluku and Anan Bulkulu, the androgynous creator deity, parent of Mawu Lisa or Mawu and Lisa as twins in Benin. Nayeme. Onayeme Amawia, the androgynous great god, both female as represented by the moon and male as represented by the sun, from Ghana. In Nigeria, we have Obasi, the androgynous supreme sky deity. Obasi, the androgynous supreme sky deity. It's funny because I used to know somebody named Obasi. And they actually inhabited some of those androgynous traits. And it's interesting that he would be named by after an androgynous supreme sky deity from Nigeria. And he actually inhabited some of those traits. His appearance was masculine, but you can see a lot of feminine physical characteristics as well as uh, just regular characteristics. And that is not a coincidence, my friends. Definitely not a coincidence. Let's continue. We have Obatala, which in certain aspects of his story, he can sometimes be an androgynous Orisha. Um, there's times where she or he divided themselves into a male-female pair like Odudoa and Yamu. And in Yangba is the feminine side of Obatala. Then we have Ogun as Ogum Soreke. 
which can be found in voodoo and certain other aspects as well. An aspect in which Ogun merges with a shoe, this male male being is a patron of lesbian woman. And we have Olokun, which is the Orisha of the deep, deeper parts of the ocean, which is the androgynous ruler of the depths of the sea. He, she is not only androgynous, but also a hybrid human fish. We have Orumila. An Orisha who is in one of his manifestations is an Adodi. Adadi, a gender variant male who engages in same sex eroticism. Mm hmm. Unsanin, a meta meta or androgynous and intersex Orisha. And we have Oshumare. Oshumare, Dambala, Dambala can be an androgynous serpent rainbow. Then we have Oshun. Oshun Erazuli, as Oshun Yeye Ipona, Oshun Yeye Iponada, or Ipanda, and Oshun Yeye Kare, and Oshun Pashangeye Pashangara is associated with gender variant and lesbian woman who tends to sometimes be a patron of prostitutes and gay and gender variant males. This I know for a fact because I know somebody who actually walks this path. And they are gender variant. You have Oya is a woman warrior and a patron of gender variant and homoerotically inclined males. You have pom uh, Pompagire or Erazuli Flambe, Flambeau. A patron of gender variant and homosexual men. You have Set or Satuk, who sometimes can be depicted as a pansexual deity. You have Shango, although he is very divine masculine warrior king type, he does have effeminate robes in which he dresses and behaves as a sensuous and or Amazonian woman. That's one of his paths. You have So, or Sa, from Benin, an androgynous deity born of Mawu Lisa. You have Tano, from Ghana, a bisexual sky and fertility deity. You have Tem, or Timu, which sometimes is known as the Great Hishi. You have Vandu from Africa, which is an androgynous deity. We have from Kemet, we have Waj Weir, an androgynous deity. Yamaya, in one of her aspects, is capable of transforming herself into a man or a mouse. As Yamaya Okuti, she is referred to as an Obini, a Logun. A woman warrior. She is linked to gender variant and lesbian woman. I could go on and on. There's Aztec deities here. There's Chinese deities. There's Hindu deities. I could go on and on and on and on and on. Talking about their sharing this. The point is this. It's not to scare you. It's not to make you run. It's not to make you hide. The point is this. It's to make you face a reality that. 
when you really start to work sorcery, please leave your narrow-minded bullshit at home. I've been at a goon ceremony. And I have seen a straight masculine warrior dude be mounted by a female and he starts walking and talking and moving like a female. So people, don't get it twisted because if you're really in this African culture like you say you are, you got to open your mind. Because when you see some of these things at Igun ceremonies, you be like, what? If you still have this so-called super conscious African-centered, Afrocentric mind, you must be a fool, to be honest with you, because that's not how a lot of things roll in certain African traditions and certain African spiritual uh, spirituality or certain groups of Africans don't roll like that. You roll like that. Because you really have been influenced by Europeans and don't understand that. Now, trust me, I'm a very masculine dude very warrior type dude. I'm a very strong person, but I understand because I've been around these traditions for years and I understand when I saw these things happening, I was like, wait a second, how can a masculine warrior type dude have a feminine female spirit mount him and he starts to behave just like a female? That's when I knew that in the spirit realm, things ain't what they are here in the physical realm. A spirit does not give a damn what you profess your gender is, what you profess your your uh, sexual preferences are. A spirit is trying to connect with you to either give a message or get some work done. Remember that, people. You got to really start to think about these things because... We've been shifted into this narrow-minded view, and we're not really looking at our African culture in a broad sense enough to go dig into these different tribal areas to find out some truth. So I did some of the research for you guys so that you can have some information to go research things yourself and find out. So that if you're ever working a ritual and all of a sudden... You get some uh, androgynous archetype come to your mind or you get this spirit that wants to communicate, wants to mount you, and it's an androgynous or transgender or it's of an opposite sex. You're not going to freak out and stop your blessings from happening from what the spirit is trying to share with you, the message is trying to give, and the work that should be done. See, the problem is people have this fear of the opposite sex or different sexual preferences that they don't allow themselves to spiritually grow and mature by getting the knowledge and the wisdom they're supposed to from certain spiritual workings, such as being mounted from the opposite sex or androgynous spirit or whatever the case may be. So this holds you back. Now, I'm going to share some books that you all could go research some of this information from. There's a book by Bhava, B-H-A-V-A, Sahi, S-A-K-H-I. It's called Transgender Spirituality, Man into Goddess. There's another book called uh, there's a, another book called Transgender Warriors by Feinberg Leslie. Then you have a book called Third Sex, Third Gender, Beyond Sexual Dimorphism in Culture and History by Gilbert Hurt. And that's Hurt, H-E-R-D-T. You have a book called Hermorphodites or Hermorphodeities, the Transgender Spirituality Workbook by Caldera 
K A L D E R Raven. And those are just some of the books. One last book. Very good book that you need to check out. It's called Primal Myths. Primal. P-R-I-M-A-L. Myths. M-Y-T-H-S. Creation Myths Around the World. By Sproul. S-P-R-O-U-L. Barbara. Barbara Sproul. Check those, book out, those books out to do further research for yourself to understand that this spiritual phenomenon, especially dealing with the occult, especially dealing with the left-hand path, that you start to understand that one of the works is to master and bring harmony to the masculine and feminine within you. That's one of the greatest works of all works that you could accomplish. And the left-hand path especially, which is a path of working on mastering yourself. A path of becoming a God in yourself. You have to take serious inventory in yourself and you have to do serious work. And as somebody on the left-hand path, a black adept, any, any system that can work for you, you will use. There's not one specific system that you only will use. You could use any path, any tradition to get the work done. Myself, I just tend to really work with a lot of comedic and African uh, different systems and extract from there what works for me on my path to reach the level of self-mastery. So when you work in this angle, it opens you up more to understand that, let's say, you're at an Igum ceremony. You get mounted by an androgynous spirit. And you start to see visions and, and you start to receive dreams and you start to see all these things of things that are foreign to you. You're like, what the hell is happening? What is this? It makes you start questioning yourself. It's not that you're questioning yourself, it's that the, the, the spirit is trying to show you of what was, what is, and what could be. If you're closed-minded and closed off to those things, you'll never receive that information and that blessing. Then, what happens is, your growth is stunted. If you are working with Shango as a divine masculine warrior king, and in fact you're crowned Shango, but you're crowned in one of his paths, how do you know that you may not be crowned on the path of Shango that is his, the characteristics are effeminate? See, that blows your mind because you're thinking you're super whatever, super macho man. But most of us don't do the work to get deep down in our subconscious mind or unconscious mind to see what's really there. Because of our upbringing, our cultural upbringing, our society, moralities, and society programming, cultural programming. We would be shocked, disturbed, and sometimes shunned by individuals if we found things out like that. Like, whoa, why are you on that path? That doesn't mean that you're effeminate or gay 
or homosexual, that means that your spirit is not this one-minded genders that we have created or this one avenue gender that we've created in this present day society. That means your spirit, although it has masculine traits, has very strong feminine traits, you have not done the work to harmonize that. So in your in your workings, it will reveal itself and, and manifest itself. Because human nature is to judge, human nature is to divide, human nature is to separate. That is human nature. But we have to work to get past these things. One of the things that's necessary to figure out on the left-hand path is what are you attracted to? What works are you attracted to? Now, let's say you're on the left-hand path. There's many different choices on this path. Um, and you're an individual who's melanated. You get on this path and you ain't really feeling some of the some of the uh, more European centered paths. Does that mean you can't get any benefit from working that path? No, you can. If you do some work, you may get some benefit. But your spirit is guiding you towards, let's say something like Vudan. And you're like, but I don't want to be initiated in Vudan. I don't want to go through all that. I don't want to be a part of no religion. I don't want to be a part of no temple, no, no spiritual house, none of that. Because I'm more of a, of a solitary practitioner. What do you do? This is why I, I, I share this today. And I'll share more uh, different archetypes that are dealing with the masculine and feminine archetypes from Kemet and different parts of Africa as well. What do you do is this. You listen to your spirit and wherever you're attracted to, you go and research it. For example, let's say you're attracted to Wudang and for some reason, Dimbala keeps appearing in your mind. Then you start to see things all around you that connect with Dimbala. You'll start seeing serpents. Let's say you see a serpent on a logo. You see a serpent here. Whatever the case is, I'm just saying. You see these things consistently hello that's your spirit telling you you need to be working with this do you have to go get initiated in Vudan? do you have to go and work with the lower dambala no what you can do is research as much as possible about dambala ask questions about individuals who are working with dambala who are initiated if they're free enough to share certain information others they can't because they're initiated so there's going to be secret oaths that they can't reveal but what they can reveal absorb that information study as much information as possible then personalize the way you work with Dumbala. now traditionalists are going to be upset with me and say no you have to be initiated no you don't if that's not your choosing you don't but you can gain gain let me say this again you can gain great benefits from being initiated it can help you drastically because there is certain workings that are kept within uh, the uh, within the temple, the house, or you know being initiated that you do not receive in books, and people are not going to share with you. So there is benefits to that. And if you do decide to get initiated, don't do it to be a part of religion, a tradition, or follow somebody. Do it to get the information you want and get out.
as soon as possible. I don't care if people get mad upset with this whole thing. Kiss my ass. That's all I'll say. All right? <clears throat> that's one way to do it. You could do that or you could just study, absorb as much information as possible, ask questions, and then figure out how to work your rituals around what your subconscious, your spirit is guiding you to work with. You can work in that fashion. You can create that fashion of your ritualistic style based upon what you're attracted to. See, I've worked a lot of different things in the left-hand path. And what sticks with me the most is the comedic aspect, vampiric, which is but the comedic as aspect of the vampiric sorcery. And certain aspects of Vudan, like working with the Gede, or Gede, or Gidi, especially Baum Samdi. I worked with that for a long time. That resonates with me. Uh, working aspects of Palo, though I was scratched. Although I was initiated in Santeria, Bakumi, and Crown of Batala, I extract certain aspects of those workings to create my own rituals that are in line with becoming a master over self. In line with becoming your own God. So for example, let's say I've worked certain rituals with Zarabanda. And I've extracted Certain methods, techniques that I learned <clears throat> from being in it, as well as from my own creative mind. And I work with Zerbanda not to worship Zerbanda, not to give fruit and offering to Zerbanda, but to become like a Zerbanda. That's how you work. The archetypes, you don't grovel fruit offerings, offering everything and anything because you're told to. Because then you're back under religion, back under control. I don't offer shit to any of the archetypes because they ain't real. And I understand that through my workings and my spiritual workings and my astral traveling. Them fuckers ain't real. I don't give a damn what none of y'all say. You cannot prove. No one here can prove that to me. No, sorry, not happening. Not how long I've been working and stuff. No, sorry. However, I utilize Zerubanda to be a Zerubanda. To encompass those attributes. To embody the power of Zerubanda. That's why I work it. You understand? I'll have a ganga pot that I self-created. Oh yeah, but you weren't you didn't do it through your through your ta time, you know. Listen, asshole. My shit is just as effective as if my tata and going through initiation helped me create that a ganga pot. Okay? Period. I've used the one that I went through when I got scratched. And mine that I self-created is more effective than the one that I, I, you, I received when I got scratched. So, I don't want to hear that. From my personal experience, you can create your own Aganga Pop, people, if that's the, what you're attracted to. You can work it if that's what you're attracted to. Initiation is beneficial, but do not go into there. I'm going to repeat it again. Do not go into there to be brainwashed, to be a follower, to be a religious fool again. Because then you you basically defeated everything you worked so hard for to become a master over yourself. Bullshit. So, instead of even dealing with that, create your own shit. People say, yeah, but this is just for follow. No, it's not. Listen, all this has been wide open before it just became... Palo Mayende, or became Santeria Lakumi, or became Ifa. 
It was just working with the spirits. And becoming an archetype. Without all these divisions and names and titles. That's what it was all about. And when you understand the power of nature. Then you understand how to work with spirits. Everything in nature has a spirit. It may appear inanimate to you. But it has a spirit. Trees have a spirit. No, I'm not telling you to go hug some damn ass tree. There's one special person in Texas that does that. And that's that's her thing. So let it be. But no, you don't have to go hug a tree. But you can understand that that tree has a spirit. It's a living entity just like you. It recycles your carbon dioxide to create oxygen, which you need to subsist off of. So that has a spirit. And when you really tap into that spirit, you understand it. Anytime you go to the tree and leave a fruit offering, because that's going to be eaten by the cats and whatever animals are around, and you're going to think some God took it. Bullshit. That shit was eaten by the animal that need it. That's not what I'm telling you, but what you could do is give respect to the tree for giving you the oxygen to breathe. And if you listen hard enough, you meditate hard enough, you may even hear the, the spirit of the tree say, well, thank you for sharing your carbon dioxide with me. People got away from that. See, the tree's a god in itself. You're a god in yourself. You can give respect to another god. You don't have to worship it. I don't worship the tree because it gives me carbon dioxide. I respect the tree for giving me dark carbon dioxide. I mean, <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying. I respect the tree for giving me oxygen. But I don't have to worship it for giving me oxygen. Just like the tree does not worship me for giving it carbon dioxide. The tree gives me respect because I share my carbon dioxide with it. You understand? But we gotten away from all that. I hear so many conscious coons talking all this crap about Africa and all this. And you guys are so superficial on Africa that you really don't understand these African traditions or spiritual systems. You'll talk about, oh, wait, let's wear our dashikis and, you know, let's big this up and let's do that. But you have no clue what the hell you're looking at. Because most of y'all don't participate really in it. And when you do, it's a superficial layer. Oh, let's pour libation. Let's give honor and respect to the ancestors. Yeah, that's superficial. Because there's ways deep, ways deeper than that to connect with your ancestors. A lot of you, I know because I was in that community for years. And I still know people in there. A lot of y'all would probably be scared shitless if you went to a real Igun ceremony. And saw the shit that pops off at those ceremonies. You would be scared shitless. Because you'd be like, what the hell is happening? Yo, the spirit jumping from this to that. To, yeah, those things happen. Sometimes you have malevolent spirits come in that if you don't know what you're doing, you can't get that spirit out of that person. It can hurt that person badly. Not all spirits love you. and Not all spirits just want to be friends with you. No, a lot of them are going to use you because your ass is gullible. Because you think everything is peace, love, and light. Bullshit. And the spirits will tell you quick, there ain't nothing peace, love, and light on this side, buddy. It's about survival over there, just like it was here. You understand me? But in order to work this, you can't be closed minded and think that everything is just super masculine, super feminine, and that's it. Because then you're losing sight of the fact that the original people on this planet are androgynous, and some of y'all have those characteristics and traits within you. And never been able to understand it. And been confused. And nobody discusses it or talks about it. So you're left alone in the dark. It doesn't have to be that way. If y'all really dig deep into your African tribal customs and, co and spiritual system. You'll understand there's a place for everybody in our systems. There's a place to work it for everybody in our systems. I told y'all before. I'm crowned Obatala. 
I'm crowned Obatala. But I'm crowned the warrior Obatala. Okay? So I understand the characteristics. Because there's characteristics of the mainstream Obatala that can be androgynous. But I have the warrior, divine warrior aspect that tends to be very masculine. So I work, when I work it, I work it in that path. I work it as the warrior, but with the understanding that there's androgynous spirits there. You can't just be closed-minded in one way when you work your spiritual system, not especially on the left-hand path. That will defeat the work that you've done if you still have biases, Phobias and things of that nature. The point of being on the left-hand path is to challenge every part of yourself, including and mostly your phobias. Phobias are mostly there because you have a fear of something you do not understand. So how do you work it? Alright. I have a connection to serpents. And as we discussed earlier, a lot of these serpent archetypes tend to be androgynous. And they're connected with the sky, they're connected with the rainbow. But how does that connect to me? Your kundalini. That's how it connects to you. You also have the serpent energy within you. So how do you raise your serpent energy to be... These archetypes. Because see, what you don't understand is everybody talks about raising that kundalini. But when the kundalini reaches the bindu, right here, your third eye, the eye of Heru, the eye of Ray, Ra, is when you become androgynous. What? Yeah, fool. It's when you become androgynous. See, your whole goal this whole time on this planet has always been to become androgynous. You just didn't understand it like that. It doesn't make you any less masculine or any less feminine. It just means that's been your whole work is to become androgynous. So when you understand the serpent energy, why are serpents used? For example, Oshun. Oshun um, is a river deity. And a river tends to move in a serpent fashion. It winds. Rivers don't just run straight a lot of times. There's winds and bends. And those winds and bends are seductive movements, sensuous movements of a female. Do you see the correlation of why Oshun is connected to the river? And her seductive womb as well. How does that relate to the serpent? The serpent energy within you. The serpent is also very seductive. In its movement. The serpent whines. When you understand that, you understand how the kundalini moves. The kundalini just doesn't shoot straight up like people think. Cut that shit out too. The kundalini whines. It's like the black serpent and the red serpent are seducing each other to reach the bindu in perfect harmony. The masculine and the feminine. So, okay, how do you work that? Alright, so I'm working Dumbala, let's say. That Dumbala energy. So how do I become like Dambala? You learn to raise your serpent energy. One of the ways to do that is through the drums. People, our African people here in the West, especially with the younger generation, we're getting further and further away from our traditional drums. You don't have to be a drummer, but learn how to how to resonate 
in syncopated, rhythmic, seductive, sensual movements to the drum. Learn how to dance to the drum. See, in Africa, we activated the Kundalini not so much through meditation of years and all this stuff. We did it through drum rituals, a bembe, jimbe, bembe. And we worked those drums, and our hips move when we dance. And they move like the nature of a serpent. And we, the whole time we were moving our hips in our groin areas, we're activating the serpent energy to rise up. And this is why when the drums got to a fever pitch, your state of consciousness was altered. Yes. And when you reach that, that altered state of consciousness, you are mounted by a spirit or you were communicated to by a spirit and you began to see things on a whole nother level. So if I want to work the serpent energy, I study the shit out of serpents. I study the serpents, how it moves, its characteristics, its behavior, and how it correlates and relates to me as a human being. And then I study Dambala. I study a pep. I study the different archetypes and how it relates to me as a human being. And the qualities that I want to possess from that, I create rituals based upon that. I have a statue of Ra, or Ray, with a pep intertwining with it. And no, they're not fighting in the statue, although to some it would appear like that. Really what is becoming is that Ray and a pep are becoming one. See, the, the, the sculptor of this statue understood some occult science. He didn't make him fight. He made him become one or harmonize as one. So that serpentine energy raised up and Ra and a pet became as one to become even stronger, to become even more profound. Because then Ra would understand why chaos is necessary and learn to master that and use it. And then the pep would understand why the sun, the power of the sun and intellect was necessary and would learn to utilize that to harmonize it into one aspect of yourself to become that master deity or master God within yourself. That's how you work this. And that's what's the purpose of teaching and sharing this androgynous information. There's a place for everybody. There's a place for all sexual preferences, all sexual, uh, you know, characteristics, all gender types. There's a place for all that. But your place is to find out how do you become a god? How do you master that working? And find out which archetypes work best for you to reach that master level when you learn to like they say in the Hindu tradition or the Dravidian tradition the Ardhana Rishavara which is the androgynous deity of Shiva and Shakti as one which is the goal and has always been the goal the Ta and Sechem the Ta and Sekhmet becoming one. You understand? Shango and Oshun becoming one. How to master that on your workings and use that serpentine energy to harmonize as one. That's how you work that. So let's say I wanted to harmonize the Shango and Oshun energy within me. 
First, study Shango in its entirety. Understand not just Shango, but all the paths of Shango and what each one represents. See which path you're mostly related to, which one you mostly connect to. Once you do that, and you study the Oshun energy, the archetype, inside out, and you see which one, which path is mostly related to you. Now, create your ritual to work in that aspect. So let's say you're working uh, Shango. Symbolism. Make sure you have red candle, white candle, or uh, get a candle of Shango that has both colors in it already. Wear red and white in your ritual. And have the symbol of the axe. Have the symbol of the drum. You can put on some... Uh, Lakumi, Santarea, or Ifa music, you can find it, that's dedicated to Shango, and listen to the music with an open mind, open ears, and open spirit, and allow it to move you the way it's supposed to. Usually, you'll start dancing or connecting in a way that you move. your movements become very similar to Shango. And you'll start to feel the masculine raw power, the divine masculine raw power of Shango. You'll start to understand what raw masculine masculinity is. You start to understand the power of thunder, the power of lightning, the power of storms. And you start to become that. And do the same for Oshun. In one ritual, you do one or the other. I mean, you do one first and then you do the other. And you'll start to understand what each represents and how they come together as one within you. Once you do both sides of the ritual, you'll start to understand how to harmonize. It. This is the power of androgyny and becoming a self-master. Well, I'm finish off this video now. We're going to do our radio show this evening, Awakening Universal Minds on TalkShoe.com at 9 p.m. If you have any, uh, if you have a chance, check us out. Once again, that's TalkShoe.com. The name of the show is Awakening Universal Minds, and it starts at 9 p.m. this evening. I'd like to hear from y'all. Uh, if you want have any questions, hit me up at DarkCultist99 at Olaf.com. It will be below on the video. And check me out. Ask questions. Peace.